guys hear me all right? All right, there we go. Um, I always feel guilty getting up here after our worship team does such a great job. They work so much harder up here than I do. They really do. So uh, thank you guys for all that you're doing today. Yeah. And uh, Hunter's got to do double duty because, guys, you notice over here, it's in the dark right now, but right over here in the service tonight, we've got, today we've got baptism. Hunter's going to be doing the baptism, so we're going to get ready for that and get excited about it. So it's going to be a good day, church. I really believe it. Even if your Christmas shopping is not done, it's going to be a good day today, all right? It really is. Now, if you get, how many of you get our church weekly newsletter that we send out? How many? Raise your hand if you do, okay? If you don't, you're gonna, we have, we're going to have a QR code at the end of the service for you to sign up for it if you want to. It's not, we're not spamming you with all this stuff. We just send sort of a weekly reminder of everything that's going on. But I've been writing an article for it, and if you get the newsletter, you know that I've sort of been um, doing my own little version of Mythbusters today, or this week. Uh, though actually the last couple of weeks, I've been dispelling Christmas myths like Jesus probably wasn't born in a stable. Okay, in fact, it's never found in the Bible anywhere that, you know, the word stable only appears in the Old Testament. It doesn't even appear in the, in the, in the Jesus story. If you wanted to read about it, you can do it, see it in the newsletter there. But I also talked about how that uh, December 25th is probably not the date Jesus was born, but it's an excellent time to celebrate it so you need to look at that so so before you get ready to throw rocks at me <laughs> so just remember it's still a great time to celebrate it all right well today i'm going to continue with that just a little bit because i'm going to review some more things about the the birth of jesus you may not have thought about so uh, i'm going to kind of um, uh, do my investigative journalism day and talk, today i'm going to talk to you about the real truth about the birth of Jesus, all right? So we're going to talk about that, the real church of, the, the real truth of the birth of Jesus. And I'm going to take it today out of Galatians chapter 4. Just going to look at two verses in Galatians chapter 4, uh, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. So let's read those. It says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might re receive that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Let's pray. Father, as we look into this story of Jesus, Father, we've all heard it before. We've heard it so many times. But Father, today we want to open our hearts afresh to what your Holy Spirit might have to say. Father, as we sing these Christmas carols that we've sung for so long, Father, we still look for that freshness because your son Jesus is still active and living. The, the son you sent into our world, you now send into our hearts. And we thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to camp a lot on this first point here. First, I want to talk to you about the real truth about when Jesus was born. Now, this is not about him being born in, uh, in, uh, in, on December 25th. That's, we're not going to talk about that at all. But we want to talk about why Jesus was born at the time that he was. We, the best guess we can tell is Jesus was born probably about 4 B.C. Yeah, that's right, four years before Christ, Jesus was born, okay? And now we don't know exactly for sure, but the way they kept time there was a little bit different. But we know uh, Herod, King Herod, died in 4 B.C., we're pretty sure. So Jesus was born somewhere between 4 and 6 B.C. So we're off by a little bit with that. It doesn't matter, okay? Because they weren't having B.C.s and ad's and things like that back then so don't hear me saying the bible is incorrect i'm saying when we tried to figure it out like 300 years later we missed it by a couple of years all right so but but really the story of jesus starts a little bit earlier than that you know because if we just look at 4 bc you gotta ask that question why right, those of you guys again who are my age remember jesus christ superstar do you remember some of us embrace that as like this is great stuff and others railed against it because it was like you're, you're telling the story of Jesus and using rock music. What is wrong with you people, all right? But in it, there's a line in there where Judas Iscariot talks about um, why do you come to such a strange time and such a strange nation? Israel in 4 B.C. had no mass communication. That's the line from it, all right? You know, why would Jesus come back in that time? Well, we're going to look at it, okay? Now, you've got to figure out why was Jesus born about 2,000 years ago? So we're going to look at some of the details of his birth but to do it we're gonna get a whirlwind tour of Middle Eastern history all right so let's go back first to 586 BC 586 BC something something really disastrous happened 
in the world, okay? The Babylonian army destroyed basically the country of Israel. Now, the Assyrians had, had, had destroyed it before. We got a little map up here. I know it may be hard to see, but I wanted to kind of let you see the big map here, all right? If you remember, Jeru uh, Judea had been, Jerusalem, uh, the, actually, I'll get it straight in, a, straight in a moment. Israel had been divided into two nations, the upper nation of Israel and the lower nation of Judah. Well, earlier, about 100 years earlier, the Assyrians had attacked Israel, the upper nation, and had taken them into captivity. But in 586 was the date we kind of take for the Babylonians finally destroying Jerusalem and actually taking everybody away. Now, here's the weird thing of what the Babylonians did. And it was a strange thing, but it was, trust me, it's all part of God's plan. What they would do is they would go into a, into a nation and they would mix up the people. So they would take like the leading people of the city and they would ship them off somewhere else. And then they would bring it, and they would take people who had like the lower class people and give them important jobs. So imagine, let's say for a second, do we have any Canadians in the, in the congregation today? Anybody Canadian? Okay, good, I'll pick on Canada for a moment. Let's say Canada decided to attack the United States. Okay, and they just rushed down, all right? And you know, those... Those weird people in Oregon and Washington aren't going to be able to stop them. They're just going to rush right into California, okay? And they're going to make first all of us to say, eh, and stuff like that at the end of our thing. And so they take over California, and they come into Fresno. And what the Canadians would do is they would take people like Jerry Dyer, our mayor, and they would ship him off to Saskatchewan or something like that. And they would bring in people from all over the place. And then they would take people that have, like, that got, like, just jobs, people that are, okay, i I'm trying to think of any job. I don't want to be rude about any job, but a job that's a really tough job. Okay, let's take a garbage collector, all right? And, uh, and that's not, I mean, that's, a, that's an honorable job and everything, but it's a tough job. You've got to get out in the wind and the rain and the snow and all sorts of things. And they would go, go give those guys important jobs. And here's the reason, so that if anybody wanted to revolt against the Canadians, the guys who were, used to be garbage collectors that were now running City Hall would say, you know, I'm not thinking I want to change that too much. I'm not ready to revolt. And it would, they'd mix up all the Fresnans, so all the Fresnans couldn't get together because the Fresnans are spread all over the place. And they've got people, we've got people from all other parts of the world coming there and all mixed together. And so it kept down any possibility of revolt. So what happened is the Jewish people got spread all over the known world. So that was what they considered the known world at that time, and the Jewish people are like everywhere now. I mean, you can't go anywhere without finding a Jewish person. Because they had been spread all over the whole wide world, it was known at that time. Now, I think, why would that be part of God's plan? I'm glad you asked that question. Let's fast forward another 70 years to 516 B.C. So we went to 586, now we're at 516 B.C. And the Babylonian Empire has then fallen, and the Persian Empire has come to, called the, called the, the, the Empire of the Persians and the Medes. And so if you know anything about that, if you read, read, read the book of Daniel, you find about the story about Babylon falling and the Persians coming in. Well, they had a new rule. They said, you know what? We want to kind of help people. We're going to let any of the Jewish people that want to come back to Jerusalem or go back to Judea come back. So the Jewish people then began just shrinking back in and all coming back to Jerusalem. But not all of them. Not everybody moved. Then when actually, let me go to the next, see if we can go to the next slide a little bit, okay? Then actually, you see these little start, that just represents all sorts of different places where little enclaves of Jewish people lived. And they created what was called the synagogue. They couldn't go worship at the temple. The temple had been destroyed at this point. Now they're about to rebuild it, but the temple had been destroyed. And so they couldn't all get to the temple to worship, so they created these little synagogues, roughly similar to what a church is. So here's what's happened now. Jewish religion starts to be practiced in Jerusalem again, but these enclaves of synagogues were all over the known world, and they stayed there. So no matter where you went in the known world, there were Jewish people worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, that was, those, those synagogues are going to become very important in about 600 years. God's playing the long game here. So let's fast forward a little bit more, all right? Now we go to 334 B.C. 334 B.C., another empire arises, the Greek Empire and Alexander the Great. You've heard of them, right? Okay, so you've heard of Alexander. And so Alexander creates a new empire here, and it goes way, I mean, it's just everywhere, all right? It's a bigger empire, and 
Alexander did two things that were pretty amazing. First, he made Greek culture, what's called Hellenistic culture, the predominant culture of that known world, and Greek became the trade language. So in the first time in history of the, of, of at least of this area of the world, all the people had a similar language. So now, it, we don't get, really get that, and English is the, sort of the trade language now. You ever notice when you, when you go to another country, there's still a lot of people that speak, that speak English, but most of us who speak English don't speak another language? Okay, just if we, that we don't because English has become sort of the trade language. Well, back then, people, even people that had very little education, learned to speak Greek. So everybody usually knew two languages, their native language, and they also knew Greek going to be super important. Let's fast forward a little bit more again. So we go from 334 BC, we're going to go to 63 BC, and yet another empire comes to light, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey captured Israel. And, um, and actually when he did, he actually dispersed some of the Jews again out of that time, okay? But here's the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was covered in a little bit different area here. You can see that it's basically going all the way over into Spain, up into France and Belgium, coming back over here, down into Egypt. They had defeated the people called the, Car the, the, the Carthage down here. So it was a huge empire, very different. But the Roman Empire did two other things that really helped us get ready for Jesus. Okay, remember, all of this stuff we did, you may have studied it in Western civilization history or something like that, but what they probably didn't tell you in school was all of this happened for one purpose, to get ready for Jesus to come. Trust me, okay? So now the Romans, when they had this empire, they did something interesting. Romans built roads. They were the road builder. And so wherever you went over the Roman Empire, there was these, these roads that popped up there, okay? Now that's my drawing of roads. They looked a lot better than that, all right? You could... So if any, if any of you have been to that part of the world, you can probably still see Rome's. You heard of the, the Appian Way, and you're talking about the Roman, uh, the, 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 all, you ever heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome, and all roads lead to Rome because they were road builders. That's what they did. Now, they built these roads for two reasons. The main reason was to move their armies around. So it was mainly so they could get their armies from one place to another. So the Roman army was a big deal. By the way, does anybody know that our interstate highways, now it's hard to say in Fresno because Fresno is the largest city in, in the nation that does not have an interstate, okay? So we, Fresno gets slighted again, all right? So President Biden, if you're, if you're watching, which I'm, you know, if you're not, why not, okay? Give us an interstate highway, all right? So anyway, but the interstate highway system was built for us to move armies, actually. That was part of it. Its, actually, its name is actually the Eisenhower Interstate and Defense Highway System. And it was made for that purpose. So just like the Romans did. So the Romans built all these roads to move their armies around. And moving their armies around meant that they could keep the peace. Have you ever heard the phrase Pax Romana? All right, it's not a phrase we're using, it's a Latin, but it means Roman peace. The other thing it did is it moved their civilization around so that they could kind of, so they could communicate better. So the roads were for communication and for moving of their armies. So now... Catch this, what's going on here at this point. Now, oh, let's go forward just a little bit more. Let's go ahead to 4 BC. That's the date I'm going to pick for Jesus being born. Yeah, so Jesus is born in 4 BC. Now, why at this time? Well, let's kind of think about this for just a moment. No, let's go to one other date first. Let's fast forward another seven decades. Let's go to AD 70. In AD 70, the Romans finally came in and completely destroyed the country of Israel. Completely destroyed it. If you've ever seen the movie Masada, all right, it tells you about that story. They came in and completely destroyed the temple in AD 70. In fact, they were so mad at the Jews and wanted to obliterate Jewish worship in Israel at that point that they even renamed the country. They renamed it the land of the Philistines which, by the way, in Latin, was called Palestine. So when we talk about Palestine today, that was back from A.D. 70, when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. 
laid it to waste, and destroyed the temple. Now, what is, what's going on here at this point? Why, Pastor, why are you telling us all this? Again, I'm glad you asked. Because here's what happened. For the first time in the history of the world, God had a people all over the known world in their synagogues. And these people would be the seed group for the message of Jesus going around the world. Because if you read in the book of Acts, and we're going to be looking at the book of Acts more next, next year, everywhere they go, the first place they went was the synagogue. Because there were people that God had prepared to hear about Jesus. And everywhere they went, they looked for a synagogue. Because there were people that had heard about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it heard the concept of the Messiah. So this is the first time in history that happened, that we had those synagogues. Second, for the first time in history, there was one trade language that everybody could speak. So that when the people, the apostles, and the followers of Jesus went out around the world to tell people about Jesus, they didn't have to have a translator who translated from Aramaic into whatever language the people spoke but they could all give the message in Greek and use that one trade language so that this person from, from Egypt could share with this person from Asia Minor, who could share with this person living in Gaul, the story of Jesus the Messiah coming. Never before in the history of the world could that have happened, but God was getting us ready for this. Next, for the first time in history, there were Roman roads where Paul and the other apostles could travel to get to one place to another. And for the first time in history, it was safe to travel because about every 40 miles or so, there was a Roman garrison that was there to help travelers and help people move it back and forth. And there was a Roman postal system that ran on those roads so Paul could send letters from church to church to church around there so that the message of Jesus could go everywhere that it needed to go because of the Roman roads and the Roman peace. And that Roman peace protected people like Paul, a Roman citizen, so that he could share the message of Jesus. And then if we go back to AD 70, now God again took away the temple so that the focus what didn't stay in Jerusalem, but forced his people to go out across those roads to share with people in Greek all over the known world the story of Jesus. You see, God's timing was perfect in this. All, all these things have been going on for over 500 years was all set to prepare a moment when God could send his only begotten son into the world to be the savior of the world. It was the perfect time. So that's the real truth about when Jesus was born. That's the reason it was then. Because God had spent 600 years getting the world ready for the coming of Jesus. Now, let's look at, that's the real truth about when he was born. Let's look at the real truth about where he was born. Jesus, it says back in verse 4 of Galatians, it says, Galatians 4, Jesus was born of a woman. It was a regular, ordinary birth. And Jesus lived a regular, ordinary life. And as difficult as it is for us to wrap our minds around it, the Son of God lowered himself to have to learn how to be potty trained. He had to learn how to run errands for his parents and probably help his dad in the carpenter shop. Which, by the way, we get those things of Jesus that looks like he's never had a thing of exercise in his life. I think Jesus is probably pretty buff as a carpenter's son, all right? I am, I am just, that's how I imagine him anyway, all right? So we don't know for sure, but, um, but he went through all of this stuff. Jesus, as a teenager, got zits, just like you guys did, all right? He went through all of that. He understands everything we're going through. He was born to be completely human. You say, but pastor, he was completely God also. Yes, but we don't understand how he did it, but Jesus chose to limit his godly knowledge so that he could go through the same kind of stuff that we went through. You know, I don't think Jesus lying in a manger, by the way, it was a manger, we don't, a stable, we don't know, but there was a manger, a feeding trough. In fact, that's why I think it was a perfectly ordinary birth. 
Okay, if you tell the story about there was, it was this stable and there was all this stuff going on there and everything, it would have seemed more spectacular. But more than likely, they were staying at a relative's house, in, not in the guest room, but out in the front room, which was called, where they had the, the people room and the lower animal room. And so there was a feeding trough manger there in the house because they had their animals in the house, usually, especially in the wintertime. So, they were, so anyway, so we've got all that. So just a regular, ordinary birth. And then it says he was born of a woman, but he was also born under the law. And it's really important. Why to the Jews? Because for thousands of years, the Jews have been waiting for a Messiah that would save them from their oppressors. And the biggest oppressor the Jews had was not the Babylonians, was not the Persians, was not the Philistines, was not the Romans or the Greeks. The biggest oppressor the Jews had was the law. And Jesus came born under the law that he might redeem those who were under the law. All right? He was born into a group that tried to follow God's law and realized that they couldn't. But now why was that have to be in Israel? Why couldn't that people have been in Rome or Babylon or someplace like that? Some place that was the crossroads of culture. Well, because God wasn't interested in the crossroads of culture, but he was interested in the crossroads. So let's take a look at the map again here, okay, for a moment. So did we get it back on the big screen again? I don't know if you guys can see that very well. That's that same map again. But you look at this. I want you to realize it is the one place on the planet where three continents come together. You have Europe and Asia and Africa all right here together. And they all join together right here, right there in Judea. In fact, if you were to travel from Europe to Africa, guess where you traveled through? You traveled right through where Jesus was born. If you wanted to travel from Asia, is that the next one I have? Asia to Africa, you traveled exactly the same way. And if you traveled from Asia to Europe, you traveled through the same spot because to the further to the east was desert. To the further to the west was ocean, which not everybody could afford to do ocean travel. It was not particularly safe, okay? All right? So they all traveled through Jerusalem. It was one of the biggest crossroads of the world at that point. And God prepared his people to travel the world with his message but he based it out of a place that the whole world knew. That Jesus wasn't just for the educated uh, citizens of Alexandria or Tarsus, or for the philosophers or Athens, or the merchants of Ephesus, or, the, or for the elite citizens of Rome. But Jesus was for everyone on this journey of life. Jesus was born at the crossroads because he is the crossroad. And I want to tell you something. If you ever feel like you've been placed on the margins of society, boy, I did. When I got, when I got you know, I want to say terminated, but it felt like fired at California Southern Baptist, I felt like I'd been set on the shelf. You know, and that's just a minor thing. God's taking care of me. I don't even know what I was worried about. But I felt like I was set on the shelf. Maybe some of you have felt like that. You've been pass by. Your dreams didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. You, your family hasn't turned out the way you've wanted it to. You've, uh, you missed some kind of opportunity somewhere, or you were forced into retirement early, or maybe you're just getting old, and the world is not the one you knew growing up, and you feel like you're just set on the shelf. Jesus was born in Jerusalem to a people who were not an elite people. They were not a rich people. They were not an important people in the eyes of their government and their civilization. They weren't a particularly creative people. They were, the word the Bible uses is a peculiar. That meant different back then, but it might fit for us today too, how we use the word peculiar. They were strange people. And if you're a strange person, you're in the right place right now. Because Jesus came to die not for just the elite, not for just the rich, not for just the powerful, but he came to die for all of us. That's why Jesus was born where he was born, to show us that Jesus was for all people. 
you know? So if you ever feel like God's placed you on the margins of his work, if you don't feel smart, you don't feel powerful or connected or wealthy, don't you ever forget that God did his best work of sending Jesus to a people who weren't the most educated, who weren't the most privileged, who were not the most respective. They were simply the people that God chose and prepared, just like he has chosen and prepared you, every one of us. Now, that's the real truth about when he was born, the real truth about where he's born. Now, let's look at the real truth about why he was born. Boy, this is one we miss so much at Christmas time because of all the other stuff that's going on. But if you look at verse 6, we move forward to that. There's a purpose clause there in uh, verse 5, I think it actually is, verse 5. And anytime you see so that in a Bible or an order that, depending on your translation, that's called a purpose clause. And it's saying this is the purpose something happened. It says that God sent his son into the world, okay, so that. Let me read it here, okay. Um, so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. So that he might redeem those who were under the law, and that was us included. And there's two things in here it mentions. First, redemption. I love that idea of redemption. Redemption means to buy something back. It's not something we use very often nowadays, is it? How many of you guys remember S&H green stamps? Okay. And you would lick those stamps and put them in the books, and then you would go to the redemption center to pick them up, all right? Or if you don't remember those, okay, how many of you have been to Chuck E. Cheese? And survive, or John's Incredible Pizza, okay? Ladies, you know what I'm talking about? You go to, you know, ski ball? Is that the one you play? What do you play, Destiny? It's not ski ball? You don't go to John's Incredible Pizza? You're just going to be difficult with me today, aren't you? All right, so you win, Okay. All right, but you know, you go and you play skee ball or whatever, and you get all those tickets. And if you get like a billion and a half ticket, you get like a rubber bouncing ball or something like that, okay? You redeem it. And what it redeems means buy back. So Chuck E. Cheese or John is buying back those tickets with a rubber ball or, or you know, a stick em hand or one of those things, something like that. That's what redemption just means to buy back. And the truth of it is that Jesus, that God created us but then he lost us to sin, but then he bought us back through the death of his son Jesus. Now, why did God do it that way? That's something for another sermon at some other time, but that is how God chose to do it. So that's the idea of redemption, and then he uses another word that's interesting there, the word adoption, the word adoption. I'm not adopted, but I know I have friends that, that, that we're, but the adoption is, a, you know, a, a touchy thing with some people here, all right, but I want to tell you about adoption in the Roman world. Adoption in the Roman world was very different from it is today. Because here's, in the Roman world, dads ran the household with an iron fist. They could do anything. In fact, if you were a, a, a natural-born child of your wife, and you decided you didn't like that kid, oh, I was hoping for a daughter, I got a son, I got plenty of those, just put him outside. You could, a, a dad could take a newborn kid and just put them out on the doorstep and maybe somebody would come pick it up, okay, as the Porch Pirates did yesterday with some of my things I got from Amazon on Friday. Yeah, that happened a few things there, so hopefully they're coming today before I leave town. But um, anyway, so somebody might come pick it up, but if nobody did, that child could die out there, and that was perfectly legal because a natural-born kid could be dumped at any point. Or a natural-born kid could be 45 years old, and the dad said, you know what, I'm tired of you, you're out of the will. And that was it. You were done. You were no longer had any kind of privilege at all. But there was an exception to this rule. Roman law said, if you were adopted, that was forever. Once you adopted a child, you could not unadopt them for any reason. They were yours, and they had all the rights and privileges of being your kid. And so when God adopted us, he said, you know what? You weren't living in 4 BC. You weren't living in Israel at that point. You weren't part of my Jewish people maybe, but you know what? I'm bringing you in. Because just like I chose them thousands of years ago, today I choose you. I choose you to be my kid. Yeah, I'm looking at you. I know what you're like. I know the fight you had with your spouse last week. I know the, the, the thoughts you had just driving to church today. I know what you want to do to that other driver 
that was there if, you'd had, if you thought you could get away with it? I know all the mistakes you've made in your past. I see every scratch, every dent, every scuff, every mistake in your life. And I still choose you. I want you to be a part of my kingdom. I adopt you because my son redeemed you, bought you back from the cross. But now, I started off by telling you that God started preparing for the birth of Jesus in 586 B.C. I lied. That's not really true. It actually began about 800 years earlier than that. Because somewhere around the 1300s B.C., somewhere around in there, God established the sacrificial system, okay? The sacrificial system so that they would sacrifice bulls and goats and sheep and turtle doves, whatever that is, to, uh, um, it's, I think it's a dove with a shell on it, isn't it? I don't know if that's what, anyway, so, but it's, you know, I, that was silly. Some of you, that's the first moment you've woken up this whole sermon, okay? So, all right, all right. But they did all these sacrifices to be right with God to pay for their sins. In fact, if you look at Ro- in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, it says this. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. It says, And according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's what the Jewish people were raised with. The culture into which Jesus came said that, that you cannot get forgiven without sacrifice, without a shedding of blood. That's according to the law. And so, that's, so they did all the temple sacrifices. In fact, if you read back when Solomon dedicated the temple, what, they sacrificed like a billion and a half sheep or something? I don't know. It was, it was some big number. number. More sheep than I can imagine in one spot, okay? It was several, several tens of thousands or something. I don't remember exactly. All right, so that's Hebrews chapter 9. But then Hebrews chapter 10, just less than a full chapter away, it says this. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. What? Huh? How can you say in chapter 9, you cannot get forgiveness without shedding of blood, and for 2,000 years you had us killing bulls and goats and sheep and turtle doves and all this other stuff. What is that all about? It's like God said, hey, that thing you're doing for for 2,000 years? Just kidding. (laughs) Just a joke. Sorry. Why would they do that? Can you imagine if animals really did go to heaven, how many angry bulls and sheep and goat there would be in heaven right now? Okay? That's why I say you can't t- animals don't go to heaven, okay? Because they would be ticked at us right now. All right? But what was that all about? Here's the reason. God had his people for 2,000 years doing the sacrificial thing going on so that it would be indelibly embedded in their minds that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness preparing his people for 2,000 years so that one day when God's only son hung on the cross shedding his blood for our forgiveness that many of them would go I get it Those lambs meant nothing except to point to this lamb, the Lamb of God, who takes away our sins. That was God's preparation for Jesus. And it is the real reason for Christmas, more than anything, that the birth of Jesus and the celebrations at Christmas is remind us that God, when the time was right, the fullness of time, sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem us and adopt us as sons and daughters. So as we're going through this Christmas season, I know some of you, like me, probably complained because the Christmas decorations went up at Target before the Halloween decorations were down. Like, really, as it started now? And the radio stations have started playing Christmas music November 1st. And we're like, What? We can't, can't deal with this for two, two months. But God spent thousands of years preparing for Christmas. All right? Thousands of years to get us ready for that. So here's what I want to ask you to do during this Christmas time. First, take time to remember how much time 
God put into Christmas. Just think about this. This is not just a one-time event. This is not something that happens for a month or two months or two and a half months or whatever it might be. But this is something God was planning for from before the foundations of the world. Second, take heart that if God spent so long planning to redeem you as a son and daughter, to adopt you, is this same God not capable of helping you handle whatever you're facing right now? I don't know for certain, but I bet in this room right now, there are hurts, there are worries, there are fears. I'm betting in this room right now, there's sadness. There's probably loneliness in this room. In a room of over 100 people, that there's probably loneliness right now on some level. And for some people, maybe in this room, but certainly out there, there's hopelessness right now. But the story of Jesus is that God arranged the whole history of that part of the world to get ready for Jesus to come. And he's capable of taking care of you also. And I want to encourage you more than anything this Christmas, if you have not trusted Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, I know we say that, it sounds like it's all about you, but you know what? In a sense, it was. Yes, Jesus came to redeem mankind, humankind, whatever the proper PC word is now, but he also came to redeem you and you and you. All of this that happened wasn't just something that happened 2,000 years ago and 10,000 miles away. It was God's eternal plan for you to have eternal life with him. In just a moment, we're going to be having a baptism service. All right? I'll let Hunter introduce that as we come, but I want you to re- let you know, this is an important part and step in, our, in what we believe is our growth as Christians. Baptism represents that not only that Jesus died for us and came back to life, but also that once Jesus is in our lives, our old self that could not battle against the hopelessness, the loneliness, the fear, the depression, the worries, the hurts, that old self has died and a new self as a son or daughter of God has been born. One who has the God who spent thousands of years getting ready for Jesus, that wise and wonderful God is ready to come into your life and help you deal with whatever you're facing now and help you know the beauty of being a son or daughter of God. Let's pray. Father, we are amazed at the story of Christmas, of what you have done for us through Jesus. Father, in our little lives that we have where we are worried about shopping and decorations and travel and gifts and things like that, Father, we know that Christmas reminds us you've got it all handled. You took care of everything we need in the giving of Jesus. And now, Father, help our hearts be open to learning more about Jesus and to giving more of our life to him so that this Christmas we may know what it's like even better than ever to be redeemed and to be adopted as your sons and your daughters. Amen. Amen.